Welcome, everybody. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to UCHRI's Race at Boiling Point, Powers of the False. I'm David Theo Goldberg. I direct the University of California Humanities Research Institute, uh, the organization which is hosting this. I want to begin just with a prefatory remark um, by bringing your attention to the fact that the University of California, Santa Cruz, has reinstated the 41 students that had suspended on disciplinary charges related to strikes for a living wage. While an institution of higher learning should not be an institution of policing, dis policed disciplining, and it should never have come to this, we are pleased to see that the university has reached an accommodation with the UAW who are representing the students and that the struggles of the students and their supporters have had on balance a, su a successful impact. There remain some outstanding considerations to resolve. To learn more, you can go to payusmoreucsc.com. Um, this is a third in the series of pop-up conversations reflecting upon the social fires um, of our time. Our series, Race at Boiling Point, is an opportunity to reflect on the interactive disasters we face collectively today not only to come to terms with the precipice upon which we teeter, but to harness our present day balancing act to script other systems of inquiry for a humanities at the end of the human. If our quotidian is growing into an everyday emergency response, what implications does this have for our intellectual and political practices at large? How can we embrace the poetics of disaster and triage to facilitate a new cracking open of the social and the political. Is it possible to turn discourse away from crisis response towards something more reparative? Can we envision more sustainable systems of thinking, analysis and resistance, or, or are we better off joining in the disorder? We are planning the next to be on the history of LA protests over the past half century for August 27th, a Thursday at 1 p.m. Please also consult our publishing platform Foundry on our website, uchri.org, for published contributions to the series, the recording of the event today, as with past events, and a resources page will be published to our events page within about a week. A quick expression of profound gratitude to all those who have worked so hard in the days preceding this to make it possible. Uh, all the UCHRI staff, which in the interest of the time, or who in the interest of time I won't name, um, um, they are all wonderful colleagues, as well as the extraordinary group of pan panelists who have agreed uh, to join us today. The program and its platform of presentation are being supported by grant funds from the Mellon Foundation. Uh, the way this will work, I will introduce Nina Sun Aichheim, who is our moderator for the day, and then she will um, introduce the panelists uh, and uh, explain the proceedings. Nina Sun Aichheim is a leading critical theorist and practitioner of voice studies and vocal performance. Um, she is professor of musicology at the UCLA Herb Albert School of Music. She is the author of Sensing Sound, Singing and Listening as Vibrational Practice, which was out from Duke University Press in 2015, and Measuring Race, the Micropolitics of Listening to Vocal, Timber, and Vocality in African-American African Popular Music from Duke uh, a year ago, uh, both key texts in the field. She is co-editor of the Oxford Handbook of Voice Studies and an inaugural member and co-chair with a co-panelist, George Lewis, of the American Musicological Society's Board Committee on Race and Ethnicity from 2018 to next year. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome Nina, who will uh, proceed from here on out. Thanks, everybody, and I'm sure it'll be a great conversation. Thanks, Nina. Thank you, David, for the invitation to moderate this conversation and really for conceiving this series of urgent conversations. And I also want to add my gratitude to the UCHRI and the UCLA staff who have worked hard behind the scenes to prepare for this event. 
As a land-grant institution, UCLA acknowledges, and I pay my respect to the Tongva peoples as to traditional land caretakers of the Tovangar area UCLA is situated on. Today, after brief introductions of our panelists, we'll have a conversation for about 50 minutes. And I'm very much hoping for a fluid and in the moment exchange. So I encourage you panelists to jump in with comments and questions when you're so moved. At the top of the hour, we'll expand the conversation to include questions from the participants um, elsewhere. And we'll ask you participants to submit those questions within the first 50 minutes so they can be collated. So I first want to introduce Beth Coleman. Beth is Associate Professor um, in the University of Toronto's Institute of Communication, Culture, Information and Technology, and she's in the Faculty of Information Studies. Beth is a founding member of the Microsoft Research Fellow Social Media Collective, co-founder of Sound Lab Cultural Alchemy, and she's the director of the City as Platform Lab. She's also the author of the book, Hello Avatar, and is currently working on two new books. Isaac Julian is a filmmaker, installation artist, and distinguished professor of the arts at UC Santa Cruz, where he is the founder of the Isaac Julian Lab. To mention some works from his prolific career, Isaac's 1989 docudrama exploring Langston Hughes and the Harlem Renaissance quickly drew a cult following. And a few years later, Young Soul Rebels took home a prize from the Cannes Film Festival. And my fellow Southern Californians may have seen his film, his work, Playtime, exhibited at LACMA in 2019. George Lewis, is the Edwin H. Case Professor of American Music at Columbia University, where he serves as the area chair in composition and faculty in historical musicology. George is the author of A Power Stronger Than Itself, the AACM and American Experimental Music, and co-editor of the two-volume Oxford Handbook of Critical Improvisation Studies. To name only a few, George's work has been recognized by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Academy American Academy of Arts and Letters at the MacArthur Foundation. And finally, but not the least to the least, Natalie Diaz teaches in, in the Arizona State University Creative Writing MFA program. Her poetry and criticism have been published in a number of contexts, including the New Yorker and the New York Times, as well as two poetry collections, When My Brother Was an Aztec and Postcolonial Love Poem. Her award-winning work has been recognized by a number of foundations, including the MacArthur, Lannan, and the Native Arts Council. So thank you to each and every one of you for being here today. As David mentioned, our session today is titled The Powers of the False. This idea has already arisen as a theme in previous panels, especially in a couple of Josh Kuhn's remarks on June 5th. The phrase, the powers of the false, perhaps describes the defining tension of the current moment and how it plays out will shape our future in some very real ways. Recent media headlines include, the truth is under attack, and then we have phrases like fake news. While it is increasingly important to sort research-based information from opinions or conspiracy theories when it comes to public health, the environment and analysis of century-old systemic racist policies and practices, the artists and thinkers gathered here today have devoted their practices to nuanced inquiry. In other words, their works act as stances against binary worldviews. I hear, I see, I sense this in Natalie's insistence on telling on the telling of myths. In fact, Natalie, you have said, there's more truth in myth than in truth. Beth, I hear, see, and sense this in your deconstruction of the layers and multiple vectors of perspectives and identities in what you call the X reality or the merging of information and physical spaces that we are all navigating today. Isaac, in your insistence on creating the gorgeous your distinct aesthetic allows us to partake in a particular point of view. You play with narrative perspective, angle, color, and saturation choices, casting and repurposing of your own archive to continuously form new stories, hence question those you told before. George, 
I hear, see, and sense this in your attention to the unexpected in music making and listening, and your deep awareness of the necessary role a supportive community play in a person's ability or inability to speak or play their truth. And George, you introduced me to the late David Wessel, the director of SENMAT, the Center for New Music and Audio Technology at UC Berkeley about 20 years ago. Thank you for that. And Wessel's research on timbre encapsulated our daily dilemmas, encapsulates our daily dilemmas as we try to withstand the powers of the false. Wessel asked listeners to identify whether the recorded sound they heard was a real acoustic clarinet or an artificially clar um, generated clarinet sound. The recorded clarinet sound was very quote unquote clear, while the artificially produced sound produced more of what we, m some might refer to as kind of noisy. The majority of the participant thought that the less clear sound was the real clarinet. This choice tells us a lot about our preconceived notions regarding the way truth and falsehood present themselves. Beyond timbre, Wessel's project lays bare the complexity and careful attention required in being part of and making work when ideas of the nature of fidelity is bound up with sensory enculturation, such as listening, while also remaining alert to the connective tissue that allows for certain kinds of continuity and communication. The gravitational force of the powers of the false lies not only in its presentation of itself as truth, but even more so in the connections and the related powers affiliating with it affords us. So I want to ask the panelists, as you have developed your work over the years, have you had the opportunity to peel back the layers of your own perceptual or perspectival heritages? Or have moments such as in the recent months or at other challenging times had this sort of clarifying effect on you or the communities you have either observed or of which you are part. And may I ask Natalie to start and Beth to follow, and then we'll see where the conversation takes us from there. Yeah, uh, gracias for having me. Um, I'm joining you all from Port Mojave, which is my home reservation. Um, and thinking about land acknowledgements, uh, something that feels important for me to, just to begin with is as we're moving to this digital space, uh, we are also very present in other indigenous people's homelands right now through extraction and through where our technology waste goes. Um, so that's a question I feel like I'm always bringing to this space. Um, I really appreciate, you know, being here among uh, legends um, in my mind. And as a poet, I come to, you know, most things through language and also as a um, someone who works with my indigenous language, which has, you know, uh, one to two speakers remaining. I, I think truth is, um, it, I think of it as a power structure. Um, in some ways, the ways that my people have been made true are through, you know, things like maps, um, certain statistics. Um, and something that I I'm really interested in is, you know, in, with ideas of truth, uh, you know, true to, who, to whom, you know, truth at one time was very much about uh, loyalty, about fidelity, uh, you know, etymologically. Um, it had a lot to do with if someone was trustworthy or sincere, um, you know, even such strong words as covenants. And so to whom um, were you, you know, uh, pledging that loyalty and what that meant of power structure. Uh, I think you know, as well, we have a lot of these terms, you know, tried and true, meaning truth can be proven. So truth is always in a state of flux in some ways. And I guess as I'm thinking about the now moment, I'm also thinking about that word counterfeit that was introduced into some of our, our uh, text as we were in conversation. And the idea that counterfeit is something that is made against, uh, something is, that is made against what is original, and so I'm thinking a lot about, about that and about uh, you know, how what is true or what is counterfeit even, so true or false become patterns and how dangerous patterns are because um, they make us forget what is original. And so they stop, I, I feel like they stop the cycle of origin that continues to happen. 
And so for me, the ways that I've thought lately about this is, you know, it's very difficult for me to engage with some of the news because I have a, ver a very difficult time with the idea of democracy and that we are being asked to prove ourselves as worthy of democracy or uh, worthy of being included in democracy when it was something made against us from the beginning. Um, and so, you know, those are some of the ways I'm trying to hold, you know, what those things mean. And in some ways, I'm actually trying to subvert them and set them off to the side and imagine what is my natural state of language or desire or uh, want or need in the midst of some of these questions. Natalie, thank you. Um, uh, so Nina, in trying to kind of locate or situate myself in this conversation, I kept thinking, who's out in these streets? Who's out in these streets? And um, it's mostly, or a few months ago when things really erupted, it was a lot of young people, some of whom had masks. I mean, it was uh, trying to understand what knowledge was being shared and who believed it. And one of the things that um, I feel is kind of laid bare about this moment is all the types of infrastructures, um, some of which Natalie has just referred to in terms of how we're supposed to be organized, what's the binary of true or untrue, it really just broke open and all of these histories of erasure, things that can't be seen, won't be seen, the, the depth of embeddedness of a kind of, sorry for the language, but systemic inability to see, which literally has been built into our perception, our visual perception particularly. And I'm so interested also to hear a little bit more, particularly from you and George about is the sonic trace uh, a kind of a, a space of potential greater freedom here? And I know in um, having had the, the delightful pleasure of being able to resonate with Isaac's work over a period of years, the idea of jubilation, these things that are either uh, passing moments of possibility, but these kinds of opportunities, whether it's a, a demi-monde or stepping between spaces, so um, part of what I've been thinking about working on both in creating um, the piece that I did recently that George knew maybe a little bit about is sound transforms space. So taking virtual signals, and it's kind of a, a VR interface within particular locations and having sonic inputs. And from there, we're creating the sculptural, we're creating the installation of the share. There's a kind of cooperative gesture to it. Um, Amita Blackshire, who's um, an architect, she's been a primary conductor for me, and Val Gentil as well, who's a, a voodoo beat master. So that's kind of our little crazy uh, girl band collective. And really trying to play both through the possibilities of aesthetics and the space of, of the political, how can we capture these moments of, of stealing away? And yes, you hear glissant in this. Yes, you hear um, the undercommons um, and just trying to think through. I, I think I'm in solidarity with Natalie on this. I, it's not clear to me that there has been uh, a truth that we're going to return to. With that said though, I wanna code clearly my personal investment, but also I think a societal investment in things that have a certain uh, method to them, a, a method of demonstration. And an obvious example is even historically what we call scientific method. So uh, to kind of go back to the death count and dread, absolutely there was a way to not have had this count. So I don't mean my comments in contestation of should you wear a mask or should you not wear a mask? Okay, that's, I guess, <laughs> that's where I'm going. It seems like uh, Beth sent, sent the baton to you, George, and then we'd love to pass it on to you, Isaac, after. 
Yeah, I mean, there's, it's odd to speak of music or sound as, as being a place where the truth could be um, uncovered. Um, I'm, rem you know, I'm reminded of a book now by uh, the scholar Patrick Burke. He took the title for this book from a sign that a trumpet player is said to have posted outside the venue he was playing in. And the sign said, come in and hear the truth. And so when we think about that, it seems to me that the truth now, it, there's, there's more longing for the truth now than ever because so much has been covered up and so much is coming out now. You know, the stories that we told about being abused by police since the age of nine or eight. You know, oh, no, that's impossible. That could never have happened. Now suddenly, oh, you mean that really did happen? It's, the, quote, the truth, unquote. Or, um, you know, imagine, I just remember finding out Walter Cronkite, you know, what he used to say, no one remembers this at the end of the day on TV, that's the way it is. You mean that's not the way it is? My goodness, you know, and so, I mean, we believe the truth is out there, you know, like the X-Files, you know, and that makes us kind of pray to conspiracists I mean, the truth in philosophy is a project, whereas for conspiracy theorists, the truth is a promise. We're going to let you in on the real truth. But on the other hand, um, I grew up with the musicians and the, the Afrocentric philosophers who, when these people, you know, when people like uh, Joseph Benya Cannon or John G. Jackson, John Henry Clark, hit the academic world, the white academic world, like a bomb in the 70s, you know, we've been talking about these people all the time, you know. They, the books, Chancellor Williams, Destruction of Black Civilization, passed around like Sam's dad, you know. I mean, one little book, it was like all dog-eared and stuff, and they pass it to you, and you pass it on to someone else. I mean, the real history, you know, to confront the silent, you know, to confront the silencing. So that's sort of where I'm interested in for now, and there was something that David Goldberg said that I'll pass it along. Is there a way that we can make some things, I think, more systematic or turn, turn discourse away from crisis and response? You know, in doing my work on the Oxford volumes on improvisation, we found that uh, crisis management was a prime area for thinking about improvisation outside of music. You know, they don't pay much attention to what the musicians think about it. You know, in fact, there's, there's a whole discourse of improvisation that has nothing to do with music and that the musicians don't know anything about, despite their attempts to colonize the concept. And despite the idea that when you study improvisation, you say you are, people start telling you about the time they played saxophone as a kid. So what I'm, what I'm here to sort of say is that maybe we do have to join in the disorder and there's a famous book, uh, not famous book, but a well-known book called Say Yes to the Best, which is about improvisation in business, where we do have to mix it up. There isn't going to be some system that's going to save us. That we, have to be, we must be interested in real-time response to crisis. And uh, that's going to be something that we can learn from the musicians, but we could also learn from the response of... Uh, slaves to their situations where it wasn't just slave music, but how they heard sounds in their environments. Yeah. Isaac, you you're muted. You mute yourself, Isaac. So, um, thank you so much. This is, I'm an honor to be with everybody here and to, um, Say that you know to me it's incredibly um, urgent. You know our conversation at this particular moment. Um, thinking about questions in relationship to truth. You know I'm 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 drawn to the Sokolian idea, if that's something too pretentious, the idea of regimes of truth, and the fact that in a way in this particular moment. Um, I mean for me I had to go back like 200 years more or less into the 19th century to try to counteract 
some notion of truth which would contest that what's being, if you like, forsaken, what's being constructed as sort of knowledge and information which we know to be poor. And I think, you know, for me, if, and this is where Frederick Douglass comes in, you know, my project on Frederick Douglass, Lessons of the Hour, he said that power is nothing without a demand. And I think, when I think about that question about power and demand, I know that in my own work, but I had to go specifically to the black musics. And if I go back into time, even to my earlier project, what like looking for Langston 1989, like making a kind of, how can I find out this, not question of an essence of truth around Langston Hughes, sexual identity, but what were the clues, if you like, where could I get a kind of grain of a voice that would somehow signal to me an expression that would counteract all the kind of dominant knowledge which were being, if you like, presented around a kind of fiction that queer culture wasn't dominated. And I went to the blue. You know, it was listening to the music. You know, and so for my mind, there's always been a counter discourse articulated in a very strong way in black music, in um, the sonic kind of um, strategies which account and contest, as it were, the kind of dominant um, sort of information technologies. And I think if we think about that even today, you know, there's a way in which um, if we think about the struggles around Black Lives Matter, if we think about the question of voicing, you know, um, you know, there's a way in which that becomes a central kind of activity. People had to unmask themselves to articulate their narrative, you know, which would contest the ways in which people are being treated around these questions of police brutality and violence. Knowledges which have been part of the communities, you know, which we're from for quite some time, which have uh, always been articulated in the musics, which have been produced as a kind of counter narrative. And so in a sense, I do see the sonic and I, I, I like the idea of appropriating that in my work. And of course, putting that to an experimental use, um, but somehow that in, it embodies it and gives it a certain contestatory power. Um, and so that's always been something which has been uppermost in my mind whenever I'm making works. But if I think about cognition, if I think about the field of vision, and if I think about the ways in which the kind of the, the representational kind of construction of truth and how that dominates the field, I can see that I'm very troubled by it. I mean, that's one of the reasons why you know, I made films, <laughs> you know, it was to try to basically contest that kind of like dominant regime. And even if I think about Frederick Douglass, his taking of photography as a kind of new technology that would somehow, you know, give him some autonomy and some su subjectivity and authority on, his, on authoring his own image. You know, we can see that that question is so important, you know, and if we go right back up now to being in the 21st century, you know, it's the iPhone that documented, you know, this actuality which happened, um, which produced, you know, this terrible, terrible kind of murderous act that took place, which was broadcast around the world that produced, you know, um, if you like the current movement of Black Lives Matter. And of course, we know that has a very long trajectory. I mean, I guess my question really is around the use of technologies. And then I guess there's another question, I think, you know, where I can see this technology, you know, in a photographic sense, is counteracting those kind of, um, creates a space, an intervention, 
um, which I think becomes incredibly important for thinking, um, organizing and political mobil mobilization at great risk. It would seem to me at the same time, of course, you know, there's a whole spectacle of this kind of, if you like, visualization, a, a kind of link in which, you know, it's continuous kind of, the, I mean, it, had, it was a double sword, wasn't it? It was a double sword of having this image, which was incredibly terrible to watch, but a catalyst to producing and challenging the moment that we're in. So we know, you know, within these kind of regimes of representation, regimes of truth, there are these spaces um, where it becomes very important. At the same time, you know, we can see what that is as a kind of spectacle, you know, um, which, you know, becomes a kind of perverted kind of visual scenario to a certain extent. Um, so I think it's, it's really, you know, we're at this crux, I think, where things are being, in a way, um, mobilized. Um, and I think as artists, <laughs> And, uh, you know, with my respect to everyone who's been working here, um, you know, continuously, you know, we've all been in this, if you like, struggle for representation, whether it's in the sonic area, whether it's in the kind of visual area, and then the right for that, for the poetics of that to exist, you know, that can form its nuances and its own languages. Um, and, you know, I think we've, well, I'm hoping that, at least in um, one's work, that one's trying to join these um, elements up. Um, but, you know, for me, I, I felt that I had to get, <laughs> I missed the contest of what was being the, in the news, as, you know, a distinguished previous panel said, you know, it's something that you, you just can't bear to look at it, you know. <laughs> and uh, in that sense, for me, it becomes really important you know, I mean, I had to, Douglas, for me, became, you know, a counter knowledge. And of course, he spoke truth to power. You know, he um, very much was looking at language um, and, and the power that language has um, when it can be articulated from the, you know, slave's point of view, you know. So, I mean, it's kind of incredible, I think. And um, it, it's you know, it's very powerful, I think. Um, so um, I was very moved by making this work. I mean, of course, we could talk about lots of other things. Um, but of course, you know, for me, it's very much about trying to make these interventions in our culture at a time when it's incredibly critical. Thank you so much, Isaac. I can only imagine what, what it must be like as a filmmaker uh, and as an installation artist, a uh, visual artist, to be um, interacting with, with these images, moving images with sound as well. Um, I come back to, to your phrase, Natalie, truth as power structure. And, and um, when certain moments come together, so we hear what has already been screamed out loud like look at us look this is what's happening george you were mentioning this like wh why is it that at a certain moment that is actually heard so there are, we're heard now you each of you talk about narratives um when those narratives are being heard when they're not being heard um whose narratives are being heard and um and also to what kind of technologies we each as we try to navigate this world go to to try to help us express our own agency, subjectivity. Um, so you, Isaac, talked about the blues as a kind of technology that you went to to try to understand how to express some of what you needed to express. Um, and um, Natalie, I, I keep thinking about something very moving that you uh, said in a talk, um, how, how um, truths come to um, your community in Navajo through dreams. And if that technology is not um, being passed on and carried within the community, um, how can we then get those messages? 
So um, I was wondering if you wanted to talk about that, about the responsibility, a kind of collective responsibility to be able to, to express and hear um, what needs to be expressed and what needs to be heard. Yeah, um, and so in Mojave culture, uh, dreams are, um, they, they don't, they aren't the thing that happens at night when you go to sleep, for example. Um, but it, it reminds me just kind of being able to thread that back through um, some of the things that Beth and, and Isaac and George had said. I, I think there's something that I'm interested in terms of what is the sensuality of truth? and how technology is mm -hmm. a part of that question. You know, the idea of ocular centrism and, and what does that mean that, um, you know, like what does that mean that some of these things are being captured with the iPhone? Mm -hmm. And uh, we have this, I mean, we've had this for many years now, but uh, especially in poetry, but this idea of like poetry of witness and what does that mean of, uh, our sensuality, like how, how is our body connected? Um, and one of the ways that, that we think about the body um, and that we think about uh, autonomy is our, our, we only have autonomy in relation to the whole. You know, I live in a community where my neighbors are my family, um, where my community itself is a kind of family. And, and so all of my actions are in relation to them even though they are very much, you know, individual actions. Uh, and so one of the ways we think, uh, and I think there's something about uh, truth that is, that must be out of time. That's one of the ways we, we are taught is, um, you know, to be out of time. Uh, because for us, uh, you know, of course, always the resistance to, to being seen as from another time or, you know, in this kind of uh, lens of the museum. Um, and always having to prove that we are contemporary, you know, that we have a type of future. Um, and so there's something for us about the idea of, uh, of what is the dream. And for us, it, it's the place that, uh, that already exists for you to arrive in. Um, and I think there's something, uh, thinking about uh, Beth's question is like, who is out in the streets? Who is out in the streets? One of the things that feels uh, so powerful to me about this movement, um, that they're young people for sure, but they're coming together with all of these different lexicons and languages. And it's creating many tensions. And, but we've been afraid of those tensions for a very long time. Yeah. You know, I'm thinking about, um, I mean, I'm thinking of, of course, always indigenous movements. I'm thinking of, and by indigenous, I, I mean all of our different connections to our land. So that's very encompassing. Um, but how um, a lot of the, uh, the black movements in America have been uh, tied in some way or have been part of this river of momentum that is very much touching, overlapping, diverging from indigenous movements um, from from Cesar Chavez, you know, to Standing Rock, for example. Um, and so, so I think there's something about the ways Mojave, Mojaves think about dreams, meaning uh, it's already been dreamed for me. And so I will arrive at it. And what's most important is how I will do that arriving um, and who will be there when I arrive. And that's something uh, I think we're seeing in the streets right now in a way that we haven't in a while mm -hmm. from, from some of the, the small medic groups yeah. uh, that are going out and, and being willing to, uh, to be there for those people's arrivals in the streets. Um, and, and I think that's, for me, that's one of the ways that our dreams work as something that is very much autonomous um, are the, the thing that you mentioned with um, something my elders are very worried about. Uh, for example, our, we dream best near our mountain. I'm, I'm motioning this way because if I look mm -hmm. north out my door, I see our creation mountain. And if I look south, I see where we go when we move to the next space. Um, but they're worried that uh, these dreams are happening, but they're happening in Mojave and our young people don't know Mojave. So they might not be hearing, uh, like you know, what's being said. However, I think that I I feel like language and especially thinking in terms of image and the sonic, uh, language is not the body. 
it's one of many ways to carry the body. And so I feel like uh, those, those who are having those dreams, the same way those young people out in the streets right now, you, you'll learn it as you go. You're carrying it in you. And it, it has, and this I think is why truth has to be out of time uh, or the way that I'm dealing with it, because it, it, for me, it must be beyond a kind of surveillance, you know, so it must still be unexpected. And so that I think is, uh, for me, why the ways I've learned dreams have felt so important because it's the unknown and the unknown is a very natural condition. It's not something to be afraid of. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something that yes, is, is tense, but tension is also another way of thinking about creativity. So those are some of the ways I'm trying to hold some of those things uh, within our conversation here. Mm, yeah. And the unknown. Um, uh, and uh, language doesn't have to maybe be in words. It can be, you talk about language being very physical and maybe so maybe also the language is felt as much as heard. Um, I'm thinking of myself not uh, having to write or choosing to write in a foreign language, how that very, very difficult process slowed me so much down and not having the words for things actually had made me go uh, into another kind of um, place of trying to understand what I was trying to think. So there, there are all kinds of kinds of sides to this, um, to linguistic, the linguistic aspect of language and knowledge. I'm thinking, um, as Natalie was speaking, I was thinking about um, something I heard Beth say, and, and of course about um, some of George's work. So what I heard you, Beth, say in the presentation was that you, you don't want to live in a kind of community where you don't go out into the streets and you see secret language. So the unknown and the secret and the communities that happen within these, these kind of coded and sub languages and communication um, channels, I find really intriguing. Um, and, um, and I would love to hear maybe you speak to that or anything else that Natalie or your panelists have brought up. And George, um, when I heard Natalie speak, I was of course also reminded of your Voyager system of how you're really creating a compositional system that emphasizes the dialogue, the in-between so that which of course talks to Natalie's point of you don't arrive anywhere alone. Somebody's waiting for you. Somebody had dreamed it ahead of you and it's in this space between. Um, but Beth, um, secret languages. Yeah, so um, when I was thinking about secret languages and a, a poetics of the city, uh, part of what I was looking at at that moment, and this was a little bit ago, was um, mapping applications and folks have already touched on kind of like the, the, the possession of the optical with the prevalence of iPhones. So if you read it in one direction, the kind of like extension of surveillance um, that we ourselves are participating, but this idea that with GPS and mapping, you could no longer get lost. So whether it's the uh, derive or other traditions of kind of drunkenly cascading through a space. Um, that's what I was hailing with it. And it was so resonant for me to hear George to talk about real time and obviously the history of improv is, you know, literally relying on that uh, a temporality that is itself in motion. And I was uh, uh, just reverbing on some of Natalie's articulation of both a, a future, a, a promise that is kind of built into what, how presence can happen or what some of the, the, the terms are. But just the place that I wanted to get to in terms of where we're situated now, um, for better, for worse, I've been spending time thinking about um, AI and you know, visual surveillance systems, the ways in which we have extended automation across pretty much every location that we, that we exist in. Um, and to have that in relationship to the current disruptions where people are seeing each other globally, whether it's historically racialized or minoritized groups in different parts of Asia, in different parts of the world, people are really seeing each other and hearing each other in terms of 
this has been covered over. There's this extended history of violence, whether you want to call it the colonial, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the things that is kind of seizing me around this real time and omnipresence of a kind of coming online of AI, and for me, it's not necessarily just coded as bad. And I know that you guys might think that's stupid, but I'm kind of just thinking about it as part of the weather or part of the context. And I can, we can talk about that more in terms of where control is. But the thing that is sh part of what's shaking me is it feels like time will be up soon in terms of the current state of disruption. And the soon outcomes of the US election, yeah, in some ways we just want to get a shift of leadership but I also am feeling apprehensive about what would it mean to kind of like this inevitable pull back to a normative. I think Beth, that's in incredibly interesting because in a sense that you think, you know, the algorithmic kind of structuring of new technologies and how they're commanding, if you like the public sphere, um, to most kind of subjects in a quite unconscious manner, and then how that information is being interpolated leads to these kinds of actions. Um, we could call them, you know, revolutionary actions, but I think this sense of a global village effect, you know, is something which feels incredibly important. But at the same time, it would seem to me, because of someone who works you know, in this area, I've always been incredibly, um, you know, not unconvinced, but sort of um, the kind of non neutrality of new technologies and the way in which they kind of circumnavigate, you know, how we look um, and perceive. Um, and if we connect back to the site, we can see that there's a way in which, of course, you know, it is a very nebulous moment because. <laughs> In a way, those technologies can be seized by the right and the left and used to very facts, you know. And so, um, but I think, you know, you're right in the sense that, you know, that it has created this incredible kind of opening, you know, which we know can be closed down, you know, immediately. <laughs> um, and, you know, you can see the things in China, etc. cetera. I, I just think it's interesting then how then as artists you know, that we utilize these kind of technologies. And I'm thinking about George, it's work in improvisation and how we can somehow, you know, corrupt, <laughs> let's say, or transgress those norms and, and make these kinds of interventions. And so in a way, I've been thinking about this, particularly um, in, you know, several works that one makes, the whole idea of multiple screens, the way that you want to disrupt the cognitive, the fact that we are distracted spectators now, but at the same time, I guess what I'm saying is that, you know, we're spectators who are being contested and, con and in a way, ideologically interpolated in all these different areas. Um, I guess, you know, it's a very, politically nebulous moment. And at the same time, we realize that it's something that we um, as artists, you know, that we've been involved in. And, I, and then I'm thinking about this idea of then what are those poetics and how can we as artists continue um, this contesting, you know, of the dominant regime, which get instilled now in these kind of new technologies and sometimes are very attractive, you know. So, um, and this question of dreaming that in a way, the kind of possibility in making art to kind of dream new spaces, at the same time, what happens to a dream deferred, Langston Hughes, and if you like, those, um, you know, that we're charged with certain responsibilities at the same time, you know, we want an, an, something which can remain autonomous. Um, and that question of improvisation, if I think about jazz, if I think about that, that, those voices, which 
are there, which are giving me that counter narrative. What do we recognize as the counter narrative, you know, today? Do you want to pick up George? And why not? yourself? Yeah. <laughs> sure, why not? I mean, you know, I, before I started my work on the Oxford, well, actually, it was a long time coming. You know, I have to say I don't see improvisation as being particularly transgressive in itself. Uh, one can certainly improvise in perfect harmony with the dominant structures of uh, fascism. You know, it used to be said, you know, when I was reading like Deleuze back in the day about nomadism, you know, it seemed that we were reading this and it occurred to me that he thought the state was a pretty poor improviser and now the state is a pretty good improviser. And so at a certain point, but they're improvising in ways that uh, we have to counter improvise with. So that's one thing that I'm wondering about. We still have to think about this, going back to this truth business and whether we're going to really, how we're going to get access to the truth. And I was reminded of something that Isaac said when he invoked Foucault, and it's still okay to invoke Foucault, you know, it's okay. <laughs> and, um, you know, and it reminded me of something that Arnold I. Davidson, my philosopher friend, uh, mentioned to me. It was, with that, it was about spirituality and Foucault's account of that. And the idea was that, you know, we, we as spiritual beings, we want access to the truth and we don't normally have it. And in order to get it, we have to go through some conversion experience, some sort of transformation. And that transformation is like something where you actually, who you really are, your identity, your maybe your being, it's really, really at stake. And once you go through that, um, it's like you've been transfigured or maybe saved. And so I think this is kind of the moment that we're at, where, at least in the U.S., it seems to me, and perhaps elsewhere, too, and I was reminded of this. Did you, you guys saw this thing yesterday where the, the, the reporter stood up and asked Donald Trump, do you really regret all these lies you've told over the last three and a half years? And he was like, what? You mean who? He said, you. <laughs> you were the one. So he went on to someone else. Right away, Trump went on to the next commentator. But it occurred to me that this was not directed at Trump. It was directed at his colleagues in the media who would basically done nothing for the last three and a half years but nod their heads at the most outrageous crap. I mean, drinking bleach was, you know, the doctors, the infectious disease specialists are nodding their head like bobblehead dolls when the guy says drinking bleach. And so at a certain point, you began to see that in order for society to overcome that, uh, there might be a conversion experience involved. But my fear, in a way, is that that conversion experience is going to come at a fairly high cost. Um, you know, when I heard people say, well, we should all make sure if Trump gets elected, that's great, because then it will force the people to come to grips with their situation, and they'll rise up and rebel. Well, it hasn't mm -hmm. happened yet. It's hard to rise up and rebel. You get killed for it. So... You know, a lot of people don't want to be killed or they, they have families to support. So they try to muddle on through. And But we're at the stage now, I don't know what's going to happen, but we're experiencing perhaps a nonviolent conversion experience where people are finally starting to be confronted with a certain truth. And, um, and I just wanted to say one other thing, which may not be related, because we don't want to spin this out to the max, but when Nina was mentioning about the, you know, Beth, I'm an AI optimist. Uh, you know, I've been living with creative machines for a really long time now, about 40 years. So uh, and that's how long I've been making these things. So and I remember, you know, I remember when they really were pretty bad. And now they play well enough so that people really don't know who's playing. And so that winds up being uh, distressing for many people, just like the Vocaloid that Nina was working on was distressing. They could sound like uh, 
suddenly the eternal verities of identity and the body were somehow being challenged by these things that sounded like they had bodies but didn't, that sounded black but weren't. I mean, the Vocaloid in that sense wasn't any different from, you know, that the early generation of white soul singers. I, I mean, or the idea that you could tell who, what the person's race was by how they sounded. And that was always absurd, but some people consist in believing it. Or what about, you know, Marian Anderson? She, she klingt Deutsch aus, you know? <laughs> you know? What are you going to do with that? So, um, and when you're talking about those kinds of artificial performances and the idea of the body becomes not a repository of truth anymore. And so this leads me to, I mean, it's like what, Natalie, you mentioned earlier about, I'm taking these notes from time to time, about counterfeits, and that turned up also in the narrative for this panel. You know, Noel Ignato, who died recently, uh, he, you know, he talked about, the, he had, the, he had the, um, the journal called Race Trader, and he said that, uh, he talked about counterfeit whites, that in order to be a counterfeit white, he didn't mean like black people passing for white, like imitation of life, you know. He meant like white people passing for people who support the regime of falsehood to which we're all subjected. But when they're asked to collude, and there's a lot of social science research about how white people are constantly asked to collude in racism. Like, and then they say, well, what? Uh, what are you talking about? Oh, you thought I was white. And his theory was that once there were enough counterfeit whites out there, the entire regime was destabilized, just like counterfeit currency. You know, when you're getting a $100 bill, you know that it's probably fake, so you don't accept it. And the whole system of currency starts to fall apart. And so what you've got is all these people with double consciousness, not just for, not just for black people anymore, but you've got this double consciousness that pervades where it's not only the black people who are like Jason Bourne, but everybody is actually having to find, having a truth within themselves and then being able to bring that out at the right moment in the right community. And so once that community reaches a certain critical mass, it doesn't have to be a majority. It can just be enough people so that the regime kind of collapses. And this is what I'm hoping will happen, you know. I mean, if my dad were here, 37 years in the post office, the guy messing with the post office, I can't imagine what he would say. Totally unprintable, <laughs> what this guy would say. Hmm. We have a kind of cluster of concepts uh, now that relates, I think, to one of the questions that have been sent in. And that question is around um, the word or the idea of origin, which has been brought up at various points. And uh, George just highlighted that. So you brought up the term counterfeit, double consciousness, um, uh, truth, of course. Um, so this question says that uh, this person finds the idea of origin interested, uh, interesting, and they're curious to hear more from you um, about how you understand origin, what you understand origin to mean in the context of thinking about racism and the legacy of colonialism. So the idea of origin in the context of racism and the legacies of colonialism. Um, anybody who wants to pick that up? Hmm. Well, we've been debating questions around post-coloniality for some time, haven't we? Hmm. <laughs> and I mean, it would seem to me that, um, you know, I mean, coming, you know, from the heart of a colonial project, um, England, um, you know, that obviously America, you know, is, you know, obviously been a post-colonial society and the question of that coloniality is just so present in um, the ways in which whiteness functions. But I mean, I think this kind of masquerade, um, you know, of whiteness and its performative actions and the way in which George has constructed um, the counter narrative to that as counter counterfeit white subjectivities that can somehow invade um, with this double consciousness. You know, we're hoping that something that can come to roost. You know, um, 
Although I'm not sure, you know, I mean, I think that's a troubling aspect of the way in which the algorithmic aspects of new technologies and how it can be rearticulated to undermine, um, you know, these sort of kind of possibilities. Um, it, it's something which I think is, you know, incredibly pernicious. Um, and as I said, I'm very, you know, consciously kind of, um, you know, um, worrisome about that. You know, but I certainly do think there's a way in which, you know, it, 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 you know, the questions of post-coloniality and colonialization and racism, you know, I mean, these kind of ways in which, if we go back to the 19th century, they've been there in this kind of optical, cognitive, ocular sense, you know. I mean, that's why I have looked sometimes to the kind of sonic aspects that provide in some ways, sometimes stronger counter narratives. Um, yeah, no, it's uh, building on what Julian's pointing to. Um, with origin, I'm. It's hard for me not to take that word and hear it in a eugenic sense, in the way that Wendy Chun has argued for a certain structure of eugenics in code, and now we can read it back to. Um, histories of violence, racialized histories of violence. And it, it's not by chance that part of the, the world that we live with, we've got uh, laws and regulations and documents of ownership. And that's a kind of origin of properties, colonization of the Americas, all of those things kind of mark, here's the origin of the story. This is the beginning and it erases things that people had understood previously, such as the people who live on this land um, are not necessarily even uh, agree to consent to an idea of origin as ownership. So you have that kind of erasure where origin becomes ownership in a very particular history of violence. And then you also have with uh, the black diaspora and transatlantic slavery where even the idea of owning, of having a self, that that becomes subject to this kind of originary violence. So, I mean, I'm very eager for origins that are toward the mythos and toward some of the spaces that Natalie points to in her work because, um, you know, as Isaac opened up with, we've been, we've been troubling with the post-colonial for a minute now, yeah? I think too, uh, something that feels important is that, so origin has been consumed by the mythology of America. Um, like, you know, origin back to its like first meanings was to rise. And if something rises, there's, there's also the other side then when it descends. And so it's something that can be cyclical, but our American narrative and narrative being a very strong and controlling word uh, has tried to disconnect us from that. And that I think, uh, you know, I think of origin as very much tied to uh, the ideas of migration um, and that we're, we're moving now toward this, um, where migration is going to be the condition of our lives. Um, and in some ways it has been that for many people, even again, back to, to our activists who are out in the streets, to watch the Black Lives Matter movement migrate through so many different communities and to see how that has created new origins. Um, and I think that to me feels like one of the most important uh, ways to fight for that word again, to fight for the, not the context, because I think it's been contextualized and that's the danger always for me is when you can put something in context, it means we're trying to put a lens on it and pin it down. Um, but when we're thinking about the way I think about conditions is something that cannot be contextualized. It's a little bit uh, unpinnable, I think, in those ways. And so I'm thinking about origin as a kind of energy that's been there before, like all energy has, but it's a matter of uh, being able to reorganize it. And I, I'm really struck, Beth, by that question, um, like time will be up soon for this particular moment. 
and uh, for this, I, I think you said moment of disruption. Um, and then uh, Isaac, you had mentioned about like the importance of disruption of cognition and how both of those uh, to me feel uh, very, uh, very necessary and possible even to get to that point where uh, we are looking at something that could possibly be um, an end point because, you know, to disrupt our cognition, of course, that's like when we're learning, that's when we're forced to uh, imagine something else. But even to think about this moment as, as being, it's, it will be necessary for us to migrate from this moment and to allow, and I think this is, this is what's been taken from so many of us, especially considering you know, who has been forced to this land, who um, has been brought to this land, who is fleeing to this land, and being, you know, allowing the conditions for them to have a new origin, you know, um, and new, of course, something that has been before. But, but yeah, so those, I mean, those are the ways I'm kind of thinking about, uh, about that is like the, the rise of, of origin. I felt that you were leaning forward, George, and that you were going to jump in. But. I was, but you are you taking questions? Because you probably have lots of others. Because uh, there you know, were some with others this with panel, the piece. Uh, you know, well, I, I wasn't going to say anything that anybody else didn't say, especially Natalie, with this <laughs> thing about, you know, with which what I took to be a notion of mobility about origins, which, I, I, you know, I'm kind of opposed. You know, in, in you know, in a very lighthearted way, I, I'm kind of opposed to authenticity as a kind of origin narrative, and I'm interested in mobility, and I'm interested in the origin as something that you create, that you necessarily find, and then you sort of, you sort of, um, you know, place your flag down on it. I mean, I'm thinking about the early AACM when I was listening to those those audio tapes they made of their early meetings. Uh, they were trying to figure out how to get together as an organization, but they, it quickly went off into these long-winded speeches about originality. And it just went on and on, like, what is originality? What are we trying to do? And so what original music, we're, we're here to, what about the idea that we're here to make original music? So well, what's that? What's originality? So they decided basically that, that originality was something that you had to take the reins and authorize yourself to become. That is, you find and express your own voice, and that becomes the original. You find a new system that expresses, exp he said, we need to find a new system that expresses us. And originality, what is it? It's coming from ourselves. And so beyond that, um, that would be, that's when the decolonization starts, when you decide that um, it's going to come from you and your community. That's interesting. But then when you can be, you can be in dialogue with whoever you want. And so you have to define what the community is too. Hmm. And one of the other questions that have come in is um, an interest in hearing you speak about the idea of counter narrative. So um, I'm not sure if that, you know, many ways to think about now, I'm, now I'm afraid to say contextualize because um, Natalie spoke about how that kind of pins the situation down. But, um, you know, that's one way to think about what you were talking about, George. And I'm also thinking about uh, counter narratives or different narratives when we're thinking about the, the avatars or the ways that we present ourselves online, um, the kinds of spaces that exist um, online now and in, in real life, the division between news media, even my nine-year-old son was asking like, why is Fox News so right-wing? And I don't know where he kind of got that from. Got that from. Um, um, but there are all these narratives um, in different, through different technologies and different channels. Um, so Beth, do you want to talk maybe about uh, the ways that narratives are formed? thinking about the technology we are dealing with today or and in the past. Uh, yeah, I mean, so Nina, when you and, and David invited us for this dialogue, I just thought, oh, I spent a, a lot of time with my colleagues at Data and Society and other contexts talking about misinformation and modes of uh, dissemination. And, you know, we've got Cambridge Analytica. We, I mean, we've got, we've got, uh, 
racism baked into algorithmic systems, as Julian had already pointed to. And I thought, oh, well, this is great. Let's get a bunch of artists to talk about that. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, some of the um, traditional research and journalistic work around hunting down where the problems are, seeing where, whether you want to use a kind of Latourian framing of here's where the, or it's not just the tour, but just the, the disruption, you see the break in the system, and that's a clue to start looking at how the system is constructed. And one of the things that I think collectively we've come to understand is the uh, possibility of divide and conquer is profound when everyone is having their own kind of YouTube delivery to them, their own advertising delivery, the way that the atomization using social media platforms can really both um, radicalize people um, and also kind of force us more and more to silos. I guess that's the same thing. And since there's um, a need at the moment that's become really gripping, where people think more people will die, like I can get sick, the people I care about could die if we're not getting the right information. We're having a good press in terms of growing public consciousness around a kind of data publics, but also growing collective activism around pushing back. And, Facebook and these other folks, both uh, the antitrust stuff, but also the uh, growing boycotts around uh, companies spending money there are indications that we might be in a kind of a shift in the stream. I mean, I don't know how we gauge what enough is. Yeah, that's, <laughs> um, I, I keep thinking about, um, uh, Sophia Nobles, uh, a UCLA colleague's work on how ser search engines are racist, um, and it, it's also about, it's about narratives, counter narratives, and um, where we get our narratives. And it's not only um, it, it's not a choice anymore in terms of whether I read this newspaper or that newspaper, or tune in on this TV, ch TV channel or that TV channel if search engines are skewed in different ways, in certain ways, if the places I buy things are also um, trying to have various agendas um, going on. I wonder, you know, with all these extreme complications in trying to sift through um, everything, and this is certainly beyond any one person, um, is this where art comes in to, is, the, um, there is a question here from one of our participants that is asking, is political art a way of speaking tr the truth to power? And I'm not sure how each of you um, situate yourself in whether you think about yourself as creating political art or not, but maybe we can just say art if you don't think that's, if you don't identify yourself as that, but is art a way of speaking truth to power? Or is the location of the artist in contemporary society more complex in relationship to power structures? somebody on the field, that question. Well, here's an odd thing. Um, you know, I noticed from working with computer programs that quote improvise, that the idea of them improvising was really a political decision on my part. It was, you know, they didn't care. Computers didn't know what they were improvising or composing, or as far as, not as far as I know. I, really wasn't that privy to their thought processes, but it occurred to me that that was not a category that made any sense, that I could just make the decision and that decision had political and social consequences. That is to say, if I decided that the machines were improvising, that allowed me to create certain types of counter narratives around what improvisation was, around certain notions of humanism. And if they were composing, then that would allow me to, I mean, there's no reason if composing was defined as writing it all down and then spitting it back later. Well, in real computer time, I mean, that's what they were doing. They were writing it all down and then spitting it back a microsecond later. <laughs> so instead of a month later or, or a year later or whatever. So 
I'm going to say that any work I've made, I don't want to speak for everybody, uh, the idea of making explicitly political art, and of course people have done that. I'm thinking about the Afrikober artists, like this wonderful work of Barbara Jones Hogu, for example, which is explicitly political. And then, or the idea of the politics of color, which they were involved with. But I'm finding for myself that um, I don't need so much to define my work as political or counter narrative, but I start to find that just by being who I am, I need to be counter narrative. But at the same time, I'm reminded of this very odd thing that Cornell West said. He probably doesn't even believe it in himself anymore. I mean, he's talking about the idea of this, this cultural worker who works both sides of the street. You try to position yourself around the mainstream while at the same time keeping alive these kind of transgressive or potent critiques and so on. So I guess what I hear that, that's from his, I think it's from his old book, Race Matters or some other book, and I'm not sure he really believes that now. But at some point, if you're involved in like sitting in some university position or other, you are involved in the mainstream. So you have to try to find a way to leverage that in terms of the politics of that moment. And so I don't find myself, I don't feel I need the term for myself political art. Like I'm not quite sure what that means, uh, except to say that um, all kinds of art is being made in a political way. You know, I was surprised to find out that there's a whole right wing uh, discourse of cultural studies where they have their own journals and their <laughs> and their own conferences and uh, and so on so um you know which i wasn't really aware of so maybe i'll leave it there but george i think that's a very interesting kind of account because i think there's a way in which you know i mean well in england at least <laughs> there was this idea of being able to sort of like occupy different positions simultaneously and making these sort of interventions. What I'm struck by, you know, with our panelists here is that to a certain extent, we're on the kind of side of poetry, so to speak, or the poetics of the exploration um, of creating, as it were, these kind of nuanced gestures that, that somehow can counteract what has become within the kind of dominant field, um, you know, how you make interventions, you know, and how you do those, you know, each and one in relationship to their own practices. You know, listening is so important. The idea of being able to um, make um, sort of works that somehow don't adhere to the kind of dominant, you know, you want to be able to do something in opposition to that, you know. So there has been a fetishization, I think, of, you know, like the popular cultural interventions and how those get, if you like, appropriated, you know. So one's anxiety is for it to resist that appropriation um, and also how works can stand the test of time, you know. Mm. So, but, you know, there's a worrying aspect in it as well, because, you know, for example, I mean, I made a work in 1983 called He Could Colin Roach. It was about a young black man who died in a police station. I was being taught video art at the time. And I felt, no, I have to make this work, you know, much against my professor's interest, you know. Um, and, in a way, you know, let's say that the kind of grab towards wanting to exhibit that work or show that work now, I mean, in a way it makes one suspicious in the sense that it fits into then another kind of race relations paradigm, you know, in how we're contesting this moment of, as it were, resurrecting these, like say, works of art which can be deemed political works of art. And this is where I think, you know, becomes troubling in terms of then the, the, the expressions um, of artists who are working in numerous ways 
that are doing particular work which are which, which are making their own political interventions you know and then you get to this point of recognition what is the kind of recognition of those interventions so it brings me back to Frederick Douglass and thinking about this very long journey you know that he undertook that at the end of his life the, the lynching was was an was on the uprise and you know he you know died with that um after his long struggle you know and i think you know the struggle that we're in at the moment is the fact that, that we're still in that struggle um and then how do we measure the effects of of art and how it makes its own intervention that wants to undermine things but not in these recognizable ways you know and i think you know i'm, I'm hoping that i agree that maybe cornell doesn't hold that position still <laughs> um but i'm afraid that quite a lot of people do you know mm. well <clears throat> um the time has really been flying by and um we're already in the future natalie and um, there are many, many more questions that were sent in, which I can share with each of you later. So, um, so you know what people were thinking as you were talking. Um, I want to ask if you want to each close out with a very brief um, statement. And maybe I can just present one of the questions as um, evocation, if you want to take it for your uh, closing statement. And the question is around solar um, solidarity across communities as it relates to the production of or regimes of truth on the one hand and sonic or other sensuous regimes on the other hand. So take us into the future as you imagine that. Um, maybe we, I can just give you the order so we make sure that we get everybody in before the half an hour is up. Natalie, Beth, um, Isaac and George. That's me first. Um, yeah, I mean, solidarity is an interesting word. I, it's a word I'm always a little, you know, wary of. Um, but I, I, I do think it's very much related to some of the things that, that uh, we've been talking about. And also just some of the ways that I've imagined, um, you know, trying to live my life. I think it just to, to kind of bounce myself back to the idea of truth, I think for me, if I can hold any kind of understanding of it and make the word itself work, I have to think of it as a kind of practice. Um, and for me, you know, these words aren't, aren't adequate. Like, you know, I live in a plurality of sorts. I am very much America. And then by necessity, I also have to be outside of it, you know, um, because I know what it uh, intends for me and has intended. Um, and simultaneity is not, again, quite the right word, but um, for me, just staying in that idea is like, how can I practice some of these ideas of, uh, of migratory thinking, meaning I'm going to arrive in a new place that I may not fully understand it, um, but I somehow have to be able to, to arrive there in a good way and live or at least be within that space somehow, um, knowing that uh, you know, as I leave that space, I'll be changed in some way. And I will also have left something of myself there. And so I think that's for me, one of the ways I try to think about it. Um, my wife is a uh, uh, black American with a family um, with very deep roots in uh, farmland in Mariana, Florida. And so for me, we talk often about these ideas of solidarity, but something that we have made a practice of our ourselves is that, uh, you know, we are very committed to developing our own language, uh, you know, with one another and, and saying like, you know, if anything is true, it's going to be the language we, we use to care for one another, to disagree with one another. And somehow then, you know, how can I help you? Like my, my partner's question is, um, how can I help you be free today? And so I think for me, solidarity has to start off very small and then I can try to figure out the ways I can expand that throughout my days. Thank you. Thank you. So Natalie, if we borrow that, does it diminish it? Because you just said, your partner says, 
how can I help you be free today? And I'm just like, are you, can we share or? Yes, please. No, that's. Uh, that... I, I was like, Oh, whoa. Okay. I was like, yeah, that's, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, so I was talking to someone about just trying to imagine like the, the pushback, the reverberation, the, the rising of lynching in relationship to this kind of brief moment of kind of explosion. And the person I was speaking to, who is a black artificial intelligence uh, scientist, he said, we're still dealing with the backlash from Obama. And I was just like, ah, oh, that, that is the grim truth. Um, but perhaps in trying to work with solidarity now, I do think that it's a great time for people to be generous and uh, really generous about possible small misunderstandings in the bigger picture. Anytime we're in a room, uh, even just with ourselves, we're going to have some disagreements and some, some bad feelings. And it's not, it's not trivial. Like there are all kinds of different ways that things are weighted. But if we could take these kind of quarantine pods that we have been developing and take those skills and continue to activate those pods and make connections and build up around knowledge sharing and resource sharing and resilience making um i don't know that that seems like that would be a a good step in sustaining and not just having everything cave in and you know close down thank you Beth. Yeah, so, um, you know, thank you, Beth, for that. I think, you know, you're absolutely right. And there's something of us kind of having a kind of reflective moment um, in this kind of moment of lockdown, which will be a recurring motif, I think, in our lives. And obviously thinking about that in relationship to the ways in which the algorithmic structuring of um, technologies which have produced these amazing social platforms but at the same time have siloed as it were communities into their various enclaves um you know one's hoping that perhaps you know um if we can break the code <laughs> there's a way in which you know that we can as it were um transverse spaces um, and public spheres into the kind of possibility of producing new solidarities um, out of this moment, you know, through all various strategies, you know. So I would say that in my case, as an example, you know, it's been fantastic to be able to have works which would be shown in a gallery, to be shown, um, you know, on social media platforms and are seen by many, many people, you know, and that moment got in a way made possible through this current COVID-19 crisis. Um, and so, you know, it feels that there's one key um, that connects to that um, aspect of the moment that we currently are in. Thank you, Isaac. George. You know, I feel right now we might want to consider creating and nurturing communities that, you know, dedicated to this project of gaining access to the truth. Um, I see that I've been involved in communities that have tried to do this, but we need to go further with it. And we kind of need mobility about that. You know, I'm reminded of those Paul Richards, the anthropologist, it's one of the that's ongoing idea that he has about this research on these women rice farmers in Sierra Leone, who he basically sees as improvising, but they're not making art. Their, their improvisations are aimed at staving off famine and working with community and working with communities that are active in time and space as 
you know, truth being out of time. Natalie said that about an hour ago. And I think this is something we have to remember. It's like Wittgenstein, you know, it's not infinite duration. It's sort of timelessness. And that's what I'm taking truth being out of time to mean. Not eternal truths, but truths that just um, are out of time in the way that Natalie was saying. And these women rice farmers, they're they're improvising in an environment, including the physical environment of the environment, the soil, but also the spiritual environment, the social environment, which includes, you know, what is it? What do they used to say? They said the ancestors, the people who live here now, and those yet to be born. And those are the creative communities that we all have to be a part of in terms of this project of you know, gaining access to the truth. Thank you, everybody. Thank you each to each of the panelists, Beth, Isaac, Georgia, and Natalie. Georgia, George, and Natalie. Thank That's you to good. David, to the UCHRI team, and to all the participants. I saw many incredible questions that I wish we could have talked about, and I'm sure we will at some point. I hand it over to you, David. Thank you, Nina. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks so much, Great everybody. Work. I mean, to Nina for moderating a really rich conversation. To Natalie, Beth, Isaac, and George for being so generous in thinking aloud together. I mean, we're literally unprepared, right? I mean, there's a way in which uh, one, one has to have a trust in each other to be able to engage in a conversation like this. And uh, I want to thank you all for your generosity in thinking about the richness of um, that, that sense of being out of time. Um, the, the multiplicities of the out of timeness, um, the unboundedness that art brings to the capacity to uh, address the powers of the false, uh, the shaping of the true and the not true, uh, the ways in which uh, we're being challenged by the conditions, uh, including the technologies um, of a time out of time. Um, and so I want to thank you all uh, and look forward to continuing the conversation with each and all of you. Thanks so much. And thanks for everybody who stayed with us throughout. Um, stay safe, everybody. Cheers. Gracias. Bye, Jade.